evening, ladies, gentlemen, and children. Welcome to an uh, evening event to learn more about the Montessori Adolescent. I'm John Freeman, I'm principal of Annie Fisher Montessori. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you from across the state and perhaps the region uh, for this evening's presentation. Uh, I just want to give you a, a tiny history. David's getting started, so let me just tell you about, uh, about the school. It's fortunate, uh, one of the greatest social reforms in education in this state has been the uh, Shep versus O'Neill decision. And uh, we're proud that Milo Shep, who through his mother in a class lawsuit, uh, sued the then governor of Connecticut, Governor O'Neill, uh, was a student at Annie Fisher, who was a fifth grader. So we, I feel that we carry on uh, his tradition and his mother's tradition and a vision for social reform. So uh, welcome to almost the birthplace of uh, the Shepherd Stonio battle that has ended in over 30 uh, magna schools in the region, really uh, moving forward in, in social reform and education in this area. A great, a great deed and a great movement. I'm here to present. Uh, yeah, we'd like to get the light down. I'm here to introduce David Kahn, who's had an extraordinary career in uh, Montessori education has made extraordinary contributions. And I'm just going to read a little bit about David's career. David Kahn has been executive director of the North American Montessori Teachers Association for more than 40 years. He has 17 years of Montessori teaching experience, 12 of them as teaching principal at Ruffing Montessori School near Cleveland. Mr. Kahn was founding program director of the Hershey Montessori School Adolescent Program on the farm in Huntsburg, Ohio, and founding executive director of Montessori High School at University Circle in Cleveland. David is now working to establish a public-private partnership for a Montessori school serving eight, ages 18 months through 18 years in Cleveland. David also developed, this is an important piece, David also developed a summer institute called a Montessori Orientation to Adolescent Studies to help teachers specializing in working with students age 12 to 18. David holds a diploma at the elementary level from AMI in Bergamo, Italy. I just want a little aside, David and I have known each other for years, about 20 years, but I had the fortune of taking five years ago the Allison training in Ohio and found myself in a, a group of over 40 students, half of them from across the world, and it made a deep impression on me uh, David's contribution to Montessori in moving it to that age group and really having what is now the, uh, the AMI recognized and international model for adolescent training. So I ask you to warmly welcome David Kahn. Thank you, thank you, thank you John. John also has a bond with me. He's a, he went to Annapolis, Maryland for a great books education. I went to the University of Notre Dame for a great books education. So we speak each other's language in that way too. I also want to say I'm traveling with uh, Jackie Miller. There she's right there. And, I'm and the reason why I'm pointing her out is she's the mover and shaker on the, the uh, charter school in Cleveland, the, the uh, 18 months to 18 years, which is pretty, pretty big. I hope I see it happen in my lifetime. The, um, all right, tell me a little bit about yourselves. Um, most of you are parents at the school. How many are parents at the school? Okay. And of you parents, uh, not that I'm not, a, not interested in all of you, but you parents, are, how many of you are parents of elementary age children? How many of you have raised adolescents? Okay, you're not sure? <laughs> okay, but, uh, All right, then, um, then when you, whoops, back, work, back. Okay, I'm going to show you the classic planes of education chart and tell you about how we look at the adolescent. You see there is a very um, a strong ferment in early adolescence, I'm sorry, in 
in, in, in early childhood. Then there's a stable period in childhood. And then there's another ferment, and it's change, uh, transformation, uh, a second chance, I call it, in adolescence. And I always say to parents, oh, this is, a, if you know what I'm talking about, it's right here. That's a second chance. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your last chance. <laughs> so if you do not pay attention to this, and if the school tends to, will overlook this, this intense uh, developmental level, uh, you lose your second chance. It's a very good reason that I say get an adolescent program at, at Annie Fisher. Um, let's take a look at what we're discovering about the adolescent in Montessori education. There's a lot of misconceptions about, about adolescents over sex, drug, they like rock music, whatever they call it now, video games, and they tend to be lazy. Now, the Montessori vision gives you a much better lens for the adolescent, something like this, very positive. They're social newborns. So when they talk, talk, talk on the phone, when they text, text, text on the phone, when they uh, are more interested in each other than knowledge, you have to take that as, an, as part of being a social newborn. They're enormously sensitive to each other and even to adults, and they have great powers of projecting themselves in relation to others, other peers. They really are beautiful people, great humanitarians, wonderful sense of humor. They also are very able to understand the dilemmas that occur in history and in literature because they themselves are interested in what's human about humans. That's really something magnificent to think about. That when I look at you right now, or you, or you, or you, if I were an adolescent, I want to see everything about you. It's kind of a compelling, compelling relationship right away. It's not something I'm not going to try to trick you. I'm going to try to find out about the essence of who, who you are. And that's, that's, that's another positive view. I'm having a little um, difficulty with my computer. It keeps migrating to the edge as if it wants to fall over. I don't want it to do that. I think I got it. OK, sense of justice. Now, this is. This is magnificent sense of justice. This is about coming into society and seeing how things are wrong and wanting to make them right. That's not just the kind of questioning right and wrong of the elementary child. This is news. I am here. I have arrived. I don't want to be helpless anymore. I want to touch the essence of growing up, and I want to change the world. That change the world sounds very pretentious. The Montessori adult wants to change the world as well. So we have something in common, but we can do it from the sense that we are building the strength of the personality and making this, this, this young social newborn whole. You know, everybody feels a little incomplete. An adolescent feels their incompleteness and make this kid whole. I'm going to feel, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to have the strength to take on a little piece of the action out there in society and make it better. Now, do, am I kidding you? This is the oversex, drug-taking, rock music, video game person? No, it's a person that is a great human being wanting to enter into society and make a contribution, wanting to belong, wanting to find in the microcosm, the little place of the school, wanting to find the same kind of relevance. I belong to my school. I belong to my family. I belong to the neighborhood. I belong to society. I belong to the global realities of our time. They, that's a, that is a, a kind of Jacob's Ladder, I call it. Spiritual. Oh, people really scoff at this a spiritual adolescent in a secular age. Is that possible? Do you know what I mean when I say an adolescent spiritual? Do you know what I mean when I say an adolescent spiritual? Someone say something. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? That's on the prejudice side. An adolescent is spiritual because they are striving 
or something outside of themselves. They're striving for a connection with each other, with, her, with what is good in the world. They, know, they have a sense that there's an external, external life to themselves and their community that where they can make good and see the good. Believe me? And but I'm going to tell you a big secret now. They love adults. Oh, is that true? <laughs> you know about adolescents loving adults? No. Yeah. No. See, it's, they're pathetic. <laughs> it's a serious. Adolescents love adults. They love them because they are going to be an adult. They have a profound kind of animal sense that they need to get beyond this stage, this state, third plane of development, this adolescent stage, and become a good adult, better than the existing adults. Well, a little problem there sometimes. Uh, but they want to be, they want to be a successful, that is, a whole and contributing adult. Deep sensory stage, that you could probably say you know about. They, want, they, love, their, they love their bodies. And the energy that comes through their body, whether it's physical work, whether it's, um, whether it's love, embrace, the natural world, all the beauty of the natural world, put, put adolescence in the natural world, you have something. This is a Montessori school without an adolescent program. But the word adolescent is in there. It's coming along. This is where, in a way, um, this school is, 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 is thinking about adding an adolescent program and something happens when you do it, when you actually do it. Not talk about it, not design it completely. It's never going to be quite ready to go adolescent. But when it is, it looks something like this. And the reason is that, all right, what are humans for? This is one of the preeminent questions about growing up. What are we for? Well. Infant toddlers have a vague, unconscious idea that they're for getting food into their stomachs and maybe, you know, learning to clean up after themselves in the indoors, outdoors. Early childhood, a little, little bit more conscious. Elementary, oh, well, elementary is about the big picture of humanity and history, humanity and space and time. And the adolescent is organically connected to the same questions. They want to, to, to know about what they are for, what their purpose is. And they want to know it in relation to all their little friends around them, all their adolescent friends, and they, they take it in. They take it in. So if we look at the history of Montessori, I'm going to give you a crash course in the history of Montessori. The picture's still up there. I don't even want to look. Yes? yes. This is an outdoor environment, 19, 1922, House Fair Tinder, Vienna. What are they doing? They're working. They have freedom to go indoors and outdoors. They have lots of play areas, open space. Blackfriars, Australia, 1915. Beautiful terrace to do their work. Lauren Holland, 1939. Fuela Carducci, look at those beautiful plots of land. Children yearning to go out. There's something of a basic about all levels of Montessori education where the children need to move indoors and outdoors and connect with the natural world. Okay, so I'm giving you about four hints about understanding why we work with adolescents at the adolescent level by telling you about different natural inclinations. One is to belong to the outdoors. They have lunch. If you're French, you have a long lunch, <coughs> and you um, have a uh, garçon. Where is he? Here he is. Here with a little towel over his arm. <laughs> In India, the outdoors is significant because there's a much longer outdoor season. This child is is is, is working on the ground. But look at the look at the luminosity in his face. The natural light playing in the background. Uh, this is uh, a general condition for actually enhancing love of the environment. Love of the environment, indoors and outdoors. 
there's one other factor I'm going to give in the, in, in, the, in, in the pathway to knowing the adolescent love of the adult. I've already mentioned it, but it starts very early. You can see how early that is. And it just keeps growing outside of the womb. In terms of knowing the adult you're, you're growing up with, you, the parent, has an enormous power and gift to give to this, this young child. And that way that gift is communicated, the way that gift is, give, is given, is, has huge ramifications for how adolescents connect. All the research literature uh, tells us this, that adolescents connect to the adult very young, and that connection becomes more profound as they get older. They need to work side by side with the adult. That's a powerful force, right? Very powerful force. And this is the um, uh, mother and child making a thatch roof. Could be, could be anywhere in the world. This happens to be near Cape Town, South Africa. And the son's bush child and his mother. And this enters another factor that we need to, do, to, to introduce and to know the adolescent. And that factor is work. It's a big secret that adolescents love to work. They love to work. They have to find the point of contact, which is social with their peers, with the adult, side by side the adult. And you have to find work with the hand that leads to the work of the mind. So this is the this is the threshold that you're all about to cross, because because John Freeman wants to take that journey with you, and the school administration in general is thinking about it, how to acquire a perfect environment for that last second chance, and this is a very dramatic moment. It will change change the the whole way the school organizes as I showed you graphically. Now, I would like to say, tell you about one other secret. Love of the adult, love of the environment. These are forces for the, that live in the adolescent, unless they're obstructed by culture, unless they are diminished by meanness or by distortion of, of media or government shutdowns. <laughs> so, we've got we to avoid some of the, the um, we have to get them beyond some of the, the bleakness of growing up and always keep a positive attitude. So what I'm going to show you is a theory by Shiksit Mahai. He was at the University of Chicago, and then he moved to California, where all, all the University of Chicago professors go out to pasture. And he, he invented this concept, which is very simple to understand, and will give you an adult view of how the adolescent functions. So, if with an adolescent, if the challenges are great, but they don't have the skills, the skills are small, if you ask them to build a bookshelf and they can't hammer a nail, you have certain attributes that come out, namely apathy, worry, anxiety. Now, if you think that an adolescent looks sick in school, if you really study adolescents, sometimes they look like this. That's not because their best instincts instincts are aroused, it's because somehow there's a mix between the challenge and skills or vice versa. If the skills are big or they really know how to build a bookshelf and the challenge, they say, hammer and nail, challenge is too low, you also have characteristics in adolescents that appear apathy. They're relaxed, but relaxed, laid back in a way that implies they are avoiding, avoiding challenge and boredom. So what's the perfect balance? Is when challenges and skills match, you have arousal. I don't get me wrong on that. That means they're excited. You have control. They want to, they want to take control of their work. You have flow. Flow. What is flow? This is the Chicks of Mahai's theory. This simple little theory uh, made him millions of dollars and he's retired early. 
And actually, I explained, you know, some of these, some foundation directors said, what is Montessori to you? I said, it's about flow. And I used, showed them this, and this is what Sheikh Zimahai says about flow. Your goals are clear. Feedback is immediate. Skills match challenges. Concentration is deep. You're in the state of concentration. Your problems are forgotten. You can get control of your project. You're, you're not self-conscious anymore. Sense of time, where did the time go? A sense of time is altered and the experience becomes almost automatic. Now, what I'm gonna ask you is to take a neighbor and tell them what gives you flow according to this criteria. Now, this the sense of losing yourself in your work to the point where it's just you and the work. Just like that little San Bush child in relation to thatching a roof. Pick a neighbor, preferably somebody you don't know, and uh, tell them about your flow. What gives you flow? 